All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Tova Wolf, and I'm a member of the Committee of Lectures and a graduate student in Food Science and Human Nutrition. Thank you all for joining tonight. I would like to acknowledge the co-sponsor who helped tonight, tonight's speaker possible. The College of Human Sciences, the Department of Apparel Events and Hospitality Management, the Office of Sustain, uh, Sustainability, and the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by the student government. If you're attending this event for class credit, the lectures program employee will swipe your student ID after the event, and they will be set up in the main lounge. The committee of lectures has asked me to announce some upcoming events we have. Tomorrow night, Dr. David Montgomery will discuss how keeping our soil viable is key to society's survival. He will also talk about how agriculture can be a solution to global environmental problems and discuss his latest book, Bringing Our Soil Back to Life. His lecture will be 7 p.m. in the Great Hall here in the Memorial Union. On Monday, April 1st, award-winning journalist Florence George Graves will discuss the impact of investigating and reporting on the hashtag MeToo movement and where it goes from here. Her talk will be at 7.30 p.m. in the sunroom, um, in this room. <laughs> These and all the lecture program events are free and open to the public. A full schedule is available on the lectures program website, and information can be found on Facebook and Twitter as well. Good evening. I'm Ambar Morales, and I'm a senior in the Food Science and Human Nutrition Department. Good evening. My name is Alanis Morales Cuadrado, and I'm a senior in Hospitality Management. It is our pleasure to welcome you here tonight. And yes, we're twins. <laughs> Tonight's event is the third and last event in, for the 2018-2019 Helen LeBaron Hilton Endowed Child, a Chair Lecture Series, which is hosted this year by the Department of Apparel Events and Hospitality Management, also known as AWESOME. Thank you to the Department and the College of Human Sciences for supporting this event. And thank you to the Committee on Lectures, which is also a sponsor for tonight's event. The Committee on Lectures is funded by the student government and helps make events like these happen and create leadership experience opportunities for students such as myself. All lecture programs events are free and open to the public. Their full schedule is available on their website, lectures.isda.edu. The other sponsor was Office of Sustainability, who envisions Iowa State University as a national leader in developing and embodying sustainable practices that integrate excellence in education with institutional accountability for our natural, economic, and human resources. Our speaker this evening, who has donated his time and travels to be here tonight, is the CEO and co-founded the Bon Appetit Management Company in 1987. Bon Appetit now provides food service for a sustainable future. To a thousand plus cafes for corporations, universities, and museums in 33 states. Bon Appetit's clients include Google, Adobe, the University of Pennsylvania, John Hopkins University, the Getty Center and Villa, the Huntington Library, Art Collection and Botanical Gardens, and the Art Institute of Chicago, and many more. Together, Fidel and Bon Appetit have revolutionized the food service industry, both by introducing fresh, made-from-scratch food to the contract market and by pioneering environmentally and socially responsible practices designed to create a better food system. The launch of Bon Appetit's Farm to Fork program in 1999 marked the first of many commitments to widening that focus to communities in which Bon Appetit operates and to the planet itself. Bon Appetit is the first food service company to commit to, commit to serving only seafood that meets Seafood Watch sustainability guidelines, to reducing antibiotic use in farm animals, to switching to RBGH free milk, cage-free chill eggs, humanly raised ground beef, and gestation crepe free pork, tackling food's role in climate change and to addressing farm worker rights. 
In 2018, Bon Appetit became the first food service company and first major restaurant company to ban plastic straws. Fidel's work has been honored by many nonprofit and industry groups, most recently the Leadership Award for Overall Sustainable Purchasing Program from the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council and the ACTRA Award of Sustainability. Fidel has also won the EY Entrepreneur of the Year 2014 National Retail and Consumer Products Award for redefining the food service industry and pioneering environmental and local sourcing policies. The International Association of Culinary Professionals Lifetime Achievement Award, one of the James Beard Foundation Inaugural Leadership Awards, Chef's Collaborative Sustainability Pathfinder Award, the Natural Resource Defense Council First Going Green Award, and many more. Please help me welcome Mr. Fidel Baccio. Thank you. Thank you both. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, I got to get my clicker. Okay, I'm in good shape. So uh, I spent all day on campus today, and I had a marvelous day, uh, especially with the students. I was able to go to a couple of classrooms and, and talk about some things. And uh, you have a beautiful campus. Um, I've been in Iowa many, many times, but it's the first time I've been on this campus. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, it, this is not an easy place to get to. It took me two planes from San Francisco I finally landed in Des Moines last night, and then I drove over here. So, but I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so let me, um, I might be a little controversial to some people, but that's okay. Um, I'm kind of a rebel rouser a little bit, um, especially in our industry. But um, I want to share with you, um, especially the students, what my dream was um, and how I got to this whole area of sustainability and what the company, how the company evolved and what we've done about it. And I've then maybe spent a little bit of time on where I think the industry's going in terms of technology, um, in terms of um, where consumers' uh, tastes are in terms of food and things like that, which I think will be interesting. So I live in San Francisco. My office is across from the Business School of Stanford, so I'm right in the middle of Silicon Valley. So um, right where all the innovation, at least in high tech, happens. Um, so I'm going to take you back. We're 32 years old as of uh, a few months ago. And uh, I came from the restaurant side of the business, the sexy side. And the contract side is not such a sexy side. At least it wasn't 32 years ago. And to get chefs to come over to this side of the business um, was not easy. But I had this thing in my mind that I wanted to create uh, a chef-driven company um, that could do really great food that was alive with flavor and everything would be fresh. Because I was appalled at what was going on on college campuses, food out of a can, out of a box, frozen. Uh, I, I just bothered me. And those companies that had food service, these cafeterias, they weren't any better either at that time. So I thought to myself, why don't I do something different that's never been done before and go to the other side of the industry, this contract side, and try to create a restaurant company, not a contract company, but a restaurant company with great chefs. That was the idea. So um, as I was starting to dream about this, I wanted to create a culture that had, with people that had passion and commitment to what I was trying to do, and to also have some fun with it. But I wanted to make a difference in this side of the industry. And I knew that uh, I had to create some kind of a, an emotional attachment because no one was doing this. And people were saying, you're crazy. It's never going to happen. You can't get chefs to go over there and do great food. So. I decided instead of writing a mission statement that I would write a dream because that dream would create some kind of an emotional attachment to people. And today, every meeting I start or everybody starts, we talk about our dream first. And this was the dream I wrote 32 years ago, to be the premier on-site restaurant company that's really important to us as a company, restaurant company. 
known for its culinary expertise, and that's important, the word culinary, and a commitment to socially responsible pr practices, of which 32 years ago I knew nothing about, but that, those words sounded good, so I put it in there. So, but was th the most important thing here was also to create food that was alive with flavor and nutrition, prepared from scratch, using authentic ingredients. It was five or six, seven years after I started the company that I added this last sentence, because I started to realize, and a light bulb went off in my head, that we could do this in a socially responsible manner for the well-being of what we put into our bodies, for the communities where we work, live, and play, and for the environment. And I'll tell you how I got there in a minute. So where are we today? We're, a, we're over a 1,000 locations. We're a, probably a billion, $600 million company. We're a very large company. Last year, we served over 300 million meals. And um, we're now at 28,000 employees in the company. Um, and every one of our locations, no matter what we do, is customized. So there's no menu cycles, there's no recipe boxes, none of that stuff. Um, it's all, I don't know how it happens, it just happens. Um, and here's what we do. We do a lot of corporate America's work. You heard them talk about Google and uh, Disney and uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and all these companies that you see up here. Um, we also feed, um, and we do a lot of retail stuff on college and university campuses, but only private schools. Uh, Stanford, John Hopkins, University of Chicago, you can see some of them. We have about 150 private colleges and universities where we, we work and do uh, retail operations. And then we run a number of eclectic different restaurants across the United States, and a lot of those restaurants in performing arts centers and museums. Um, so they're either adjacent to or next door or within these museums and so forth. We also um, do the giant stadium. Uh, the baseball stadium at San Francisco Giants. We also are opening the new Chase Center, which is the new Warriors home in San Francisco. We designed all the restaurants and, and um, suites and so forth there in that. So we have a number of restaurants also, and we have a couple of sporting event things that we do. Uh, and we work with a lot of chef partners. Um, you can see Rick Bayless from Chicago here at Frontera Grill. You see Jose Andreas. We work very closely with him. The woman up here on the top is Tracy Desjardins, James Beard Award winning chef. Uh, the two border girls down in, in, in uh, Los Angeles. Um, we have a number of uh, partnerships with Jose Andreas. You probably know who he is. Um, at least the girls from Puerto Rico do because uh, he's got the World Central Kitchen and we still have chefs down there in Puerto Rico helping and feeding those families that have been displaced. And in fact, uh, not too far here in Nebraska, we have chefs in Fremont right now feeding uh, those homeless people that have lost their homes due to the floods. Um, and so we follow wherever Jose goes with World Central Kitchen. And my I have a whole cadre of chefs, chefs that go around and do all this stuff, which is really important, I think, to make, make sure that we help. Um, so it took me a while to understand what we meant by sustainability. And when I talk to the students today in the class, they seem to get very excited about what we were trying to accomplish. I was able, five or six years after I started the company, to um, work with the Pew Commission out of New York as a commissioner to look at what we call CAFOs, you probably know that here in Iowa, or concentrated animal feeding operations and factory farms. And so we looked at that whole, every, we went around the United States, it took us four years while I was trying to build a company to look at um, every factory farm that we could get our hands on, that we could get into, some we had to sneak into. And I realized the havoc that was going on in terms of in terms of our ag community and in terms of the model that we have in agriculture, and I said to myself, it's broken. And I still believe it's broken, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And so I said, you know, we, as we grow, we can do something about this because what's going on is horrible. 
the havoc on rural communities, the waterways that, um, that we deal with waste that's in impacting waterways, and you have water issues here in Iowa, the issues of animal welfare with gestation crates and battery cages, the issues with farm worker protection rights, I could go on and on and on of the mess that I saw in agriculture, and, and it's still there today. And so I said to myself, we are going to be a sustainable company, and we're going to, as we grow and we source food, we're going to source food in a very different way. And so we need a definition, and I need a roadmap for the chefs to follow as they buy food for us. And this was the roadmap. And this is a, this is a mouthful, but it's really critically important to me and everybody that works in Bon Appetit, and I hope uh, it's for the hospitality students, this is important for you too, that, that healthy, flavorful food that's healthy and economically viable for all needs to be produced through practices that respect our farmers, workers, and animals, nourish the community, and replenish our shared natural resources for future generations. Young people today, whether I feed them at Google or a university, um, get what I'm trying to do, and they ask me the right kinds of questions as I'm in front of them. Where, does, where are you getting that food? How do I know that it's safe? How do I know it's sustainable? Are you buying local? Um, are you supporting community? All those things are critically important. So over the years, we started, uh, as you heard at the beginning, from, with local food because uh, I was able to write the first strategic plan for Alice Waters when she did the Edible Schoolyard. And I took that and I said, you know, we should be working with small farms, small ranchers, honey makers, um, anybody that put cheese, all, anybody that produces food within as close to the kitchens as possible. And I had at the beginning 100 miles, I had to move it to 150 miles, but we buy as much as we possibly can from the community and where we live, work, and play. And so we support over 2,000 small farms and ranches across the United States, some of them even in Minnesota when there's snow and um, in New York, we bought hoop houses, we've done all kinds of stuff to keep them in business because I think that's critically important. I'm gonna go through some of these, but not all of them, but um, we just talked about farm to fork. Um, there's a big issue in terms of um, protein in the United States, and this is something that's really important. 80% of what you see in a grocery store is loaded with non-therapeutic antibiotics meaning that the animal is not sick, but it's shot up with antibiotics because they're bringing it to market quicker than they should. So it's an economic issue. And I can promise you that it is 80 or maybe 85% of what you usually buy is loaded with antibiotics. Well, why is that a problem? Because we've got an antibiotic resistance issue in this country when you get sick and you're ingesting the protein um, those antibiotics are not going to do you any good. I could name the companies, but I won't. You probably know who they are, the large companies. Um, so how do we deal with that as a company? Uh, how do we deal with all these issues? I have a group of fellows, over 20 of them, that just graduate from college. We rotate them all the time, and they have an audit checklist. We train them, and they go all over the country to look at small farms. I know they've been here in Iowa. Um, and they look at everything from how are they handling their workers, is there shade, is there bathrooms, is there water, what are they doing with the animals, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that helps our chefs come back with this report to say this is a good person that we can buy from. Um, there's an, another huge issue in terms of um, animal welfare, which is becoming a bigger, bigger issue with consumers today. And that's, um, where do the chickens come from? Are they in battery cages? Are they roam free? What does it mean by being cage free? What about uh, swine and pork? Are they in gestation crates? Are they able to exhibit their natural behaviors, et cetera, et cetera? That's a big, big deal. And I can promise you that most factory farms don't follow that at all. They, they tell you they do, but they're lying because I know this for a fact. 
Um, the other issue, um, and you heard about the fact that we started the Seafood Watch program with the Monterey Bay Aquarium, there's huge issues of seafood that we should not be eating and buying because they're gonna be extinct for your children, for our grandchildren, and so forth. Um, there's gonna be a collapse in the next few years of different seafood, different species that we shouldn't be buying. And I was mentioning this to those people at dinner tonight and those that ate the salmon, you can just take it for what it's worth, but there is no sustainable salmon in the United States, none. And you should never farm salmon. You should never eat farm salmon because I can promise you all farm salmon has lice on it, they're in cages, they're, they're shot up with antibiotics with dye, and you're ingesting that. And when those, that farm salmon, um, no matter where they are, even if they're raised in the oceans, uh, when they escape from those pens and those nets, they cause havoc with the rest of the fish. So my advice to you is you ask the grocery store and you ask the fishmonger, is it wild? And if it's not wild, don't buy it. Please don't buy it. It's not good for you and it's not good for the oceans. You can substitute, if you want omega-3, Arctic char, which is a great, wonderful fish that gives you the same benefits that salmon does. If you can find wild salmon, that's great, but it gets expensive and sometimes you don't get it all the time. But that's the issue with farm salmon. So those of you that ate it tonight, good luck. Hopefully that <laughs> you won't have any problems. Or you should raise hell with the chefs around here and say, don't serve it anymore if it's farmed. That's a better way. Um, we have huge issues in terms of farm worker protection rights, especially in my state of California, where, we, where they harvesting strawberries and they're harvesting lettuce and artichokes and all that wonderful produce you read and hear about. Um, there was an issue you probably read in Immokalee, Florida, where the tomatoes were grown. Um, and before, there was a book called Tomato Land that was written a few years ago. We were the first company in Immokalee, Florida. I was giving a, a lecture similar to this at uh, Washington University in St. Louis and a student raised their hand and said, do you know what's going on in Immokalee, Florida? Which I did not. And I said, but I'll find out. I went to Immokalee, Florida. I went with a chef that spoke the language. I took a reporter from the Washington Post and a photographer and I snuck into the fields. And this is about an hour's drive from Fort Myers, a very rich community. And what I saw was actual slavery in the fields. People were locked up because they weren't working hard enough with bringing those buckets, those green, the, the tomatoes they pick green, they ship them to Texas and then they, they gas them and that's how they get red. That's in the in winter time. And I saw child labor issues, I saw sexual discrimination in the fields. I saw no bathrooms, no shade, no water. And I saw people tr really trying to work hard, but they weren't working fast enough. So the bosses and these, what they call coyotes, locked them in trailers. And some of these people had been in trailers, were in trailers for like two weeks. And all they did was ship them, give them some food in the trailers, but they ne never let them out. True story. So we, we boycotted tomatoes for over six months in the company. And I, I messaged this quite a bit and I didn't get any feedback, any problems at all. Um, I think we finally got Whole Foods, I finally got other companies, Chipotle, Steve Ells was a good friend of mine, is still a good friend. Um, we got John Mackey from Whole Foods and they joined me in not buying the tomatoes. And now we have auditors that go there. When we went to the growers and we wrote a code of conduct, the growers said, we can't do this because we're next, we're gonna go up and pick cucumbers next and this is the way it is. The, we subcontract that to the coyotes and they bring the workers in from Mexico. I said, but it's your land and it's your damn tomatoes and you are allowing this to happen. And yes, they did and they wouldn't change. So that's why we boycotted them. But it's better now. They're getting better wages. It's still not great, but it's better. So uh, we're still working on that with Oxfam. Uh, that's a big issue, the whole issue of farm work protection rights. None of us are gonna be in those fields doing what they do. It's, it's back-breaking work. 
Um, the other big issue that we spent a lot of time on is the whole area of waste reduction. And um, you, you could do better in this university. I was mentioning the, the plastic utensils you guys have that are not compostable. I mean, I don't know what the hell they're made of, but they're not made of corn and they're not compostable. That's, you should get rid of them and do something else. Um, we should work as, as, as a society on changing the whole area of the hierarchy and work on food and source reduction first, then trying to take and feed hungry animals with uh, uh, people and animals with food recovery. And if we could do all of that and eliminate the waste we have in this country, we wouldn't have to compost so much. The big issue that we're gonna face, and you've probably read about this, is that in the year 2050, we gotta feed 10 million people in this, 10 billion people in this world. And they say, you can't do that unless you have factory farms. And I'm saying, yes, we can. Um, we can do it with ag in the middle. Yes, I, we can change the practices of factory farms. That's fine, we could use them. But 40% of what we grow and what we try to consume in this country is wasted. 20% in the fields, at least, there's lettuce that's brown, they don't take it, it's perfectly fine. You got carrots that are broken or they're kind of crooked and nobody, they just leave them there. 20% of what we grow in this country is wasted. And 20, the other 20% is what we waste in our own kitchens and what we waste on our plates. So if we can do better in terms of portions and eliminating waste, both in the fields and at home, we're gonna be able to feed plenty of people all over the world, but we gotta do a better job of it. So, and I just talked about it perfectly, just as protest that we started and a lot of companies are starting to follow us. And we do a lot with food recovery on this whole area. So, um, this has been a journey for me. There's many, many other areas of sustainability that we've worked on. Um, the, you know, cattle, methane, the, the issues of uh, cattle where they have this natural burping situation where they, they emit methane gas 25 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Um, how do we capture the methane gas? Agriculture has a huge issue to do with climate change. It's big. It's probably 30 to 40% of the issues of climate change, much more than gasoline and what you read. If you really study this, you'll see that the ag community can do so much and the restaurant and hospitality can do, can do so much if we put our heads together and figure it out. So what I'm trying to do as a company and what we spend a lot of time messaging if you go on my website, it's not about all the fresh great food that we do and it's hopefully, it's about good experiences but it's all about trying to move a model of agriculture that's broken to more of an ecological model. A model that is environmentally sound because it's a mess economically viable for everybody, not just those people that can afford to go to Whole Foods, and socially equitable. That's what we're trying to do as a company, and I think we're, we're, we're starting to, it's a journey, I think we've done a hell of a lot. We're, we now source over $800 million worth of product, and we've gotten companies to do things that they never thought that they could do before. So that gives you a little history, uh, and I will tell you that uh, we got to over a billion dollar company and still today growing with no salespeople. I've never had one salesperson in this company. It's all been the reputation and the brand of our messaging about sustainability. So it's important, it's really important. It's important in what we wear today for um, those people that are in the design area. Um, it's important whether we do events, it, it's becoming more and more important even in uh, stadiums because people are thinking about eating differently than ever before and certainly important in restaurants and so forth. Um, so um, I hope that some of this message is good for you. Um, the other issue is there's a, there's a huge issue in terms of wellness today that is, I've never seen before of people concerned about what they put in their bodies. Um, 
And it's not just those that are gluten-free or vegetarian and so forth. Even those people that um, have a balanced diet want to be able to feel that they're doing the right thing for their bodies. There's, there's a big emphasis on that. If I took you to LinkedIn or Google, there's 50,000 people in Silicon Valley that work at Google. We have 60 different cafes. Um, everyone is different. We've got Indian, an Indian curry house. We've got a Japanese noodle bar. We've got um, a vegetarian uh, kiosk. We've got gluten-free. We've got, got 60 different concepts all over different cultures and so forth. And every one of them is uniquely different. And I can tell you they're all concerned about wellness. They, they care a lot about it. In fact, if I brought you to Twitter, LinkedIn, and Google, there is, there is no sugar drinks in those campuses at all. They, and not because I said anything about it, it's because students said, or the employees said, we don't want to see Coke, Pepsi, none of that stuff. It's all spa waters. So we put fruit in waters, and that's what they do. There's no plastic, there's nothing. So the, you can tell you, these are young people just like the students that we have here. The world is changing. You gotta get rid of the plastic on this campus. That's all there is to it. You gotta figure out how to do that. And even if people complain, get rid of the straws. You should do that. Anyway, so what I'm saying is, is what's good for you and what you put in your bodies is also good for the environment. So think about it that way, that's important. So for those people that care about hospitality and trying to start becomes entrepreneurial and want to start a business, I thought I'd give you a few hints of what's going on in terms of the industry itself. And because I live in Silicon Valley, right in the middle of all these companies, there is a huge emphasis on reinventing the egg and agricultural and hospitality business um, through technology, through high tech. So um, we talked about wellness. And they're doing it more towards the whole area of plant-based foods. Um, we, we used to serve, uh, if I took 100% of, of the revenue we brought in, 50% of it used to be uh, spent on food. 30% used to be labor. Now, it's over 50% is labor. And it used to be 20 of that 50%, 20% of that was protein. That protein has dropped to about 11 to 12%, not because I menu any differently, only because people are demanding more plant-based foods. So you're going to see that in the future. It's not going to go away. And less protein on the plate, smaller portions, but the, 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 the whole adornment in them embracing vegetables and produce and so forth versus protein. You're going to see more and more of that today. Um, here's a good way to disrupt it. I, we talked about this in one of the classrooms today. I don't know if you heard about the Impossible Burger, but the, the thing is amazing. It's all plant-based. It tastes like beef. I don't know if it's in Iowa yet, but um, it's, in, it's in Chicago. I know that. But it's an amazing product. Um, so this company has Bill Gates behind it, has Google behind it. Uh, I'm on the board of it. Um, we've raised over $400 million without even having this thing taken it to market already, just because investors believe that this is where the world's going. Um, so you're going to hear more and more about that. Um, here's some more products that are going on. These are all, I don't know if you've, you have Ripple here or you have... Kite Hill, these are all technology people that have built these products. They have no knowledge of what food's all about. No knowledge at all. They hire or they, they bring it to my office. I've looked at every one of these. Yeah, this is good, it's not good, you're not gonna be able to do it right and so forth. And then, but these are all technology people that are saying, we can, we can deal with milk differently than we because that's an animal welfare issue. So we can deal with chicken. There's this Just Mayonnaise that started and Just, J-U-S-T. Um, so we don't have to raise chickens anymore and we can do scrambled eggs. And some of the products are good, some of them are not very good yet. But that's where the world's going. 
and that's where the venture capitalists are putting their money. So those of you that want to be entrepreneurs, think about how you're going to create a new product that has nothing to do with animals and more plant-based. You'll probably get a bunch of venture capital money behind you. And here's another thing that's going on. The whole area of robotics um, is a big deal. At University of San Francisco, I just put this one here, this blended one, this juice thing, this, this, this robot that does juice and smoothies. And it's really cool. It's a very sexy kind of a deal. But you can see some of these robots. Um, this creator here is actually a hamburger. It makes hamburgers. And there's a, he opened a restaurant. Um, but we're going to put this in some of our locations, too. Uh, it's, it's not quite fast enough. It takes about three minutes for that burger to get. But it does everything. Never been, the burger is never touched by human hands. Um, the one on the right, the Spice, um, that was started by four people out of MIT, four students. Um, and now they have a restaurant in, in uh, Boston. And um, they're, this is all salads. It does the salads, it chops it, it does the dressings. And you pay for all of this, this stuff by your phone. So there's no cashiers, nothing. So I'm just telling you, that's where the world's going now. Um, You'll probably get some of this stuff on campus soon, you know, which would be kind of neat, I think. So uh, we're testing all of these things in my company because, you know, most of these things are made right in Silicon Valley, and they just bring them over and say, do something with it. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you is that um, there are more and more um, diverse kinds of food today than ever before. That's wonderful. And so what we I've tried to preach to our chefs is that food is culture. But if you're gonna if you're going to really understand how to do Indian food the right way, I was telling some of the students at dinner um, that I learned something very quickly. The northern Indian food is very different than the southern Indian food. And in Silicon Valley, Indian food is a big, big deal because we hi they hire a lot of tech people from southern India. They wouldn't eat the stuff in northern India, so I had to hire southern Indian chefs and learn how to do that. So we had to seek authenticity, and we had to be authentic. Um, we can't fake things anymore. Um, we can't get away with that. So we've got to learn to respect one another, learn from one another. Um, that's a good lesson as you go into the hospitality business. If you're going to do a, um, an ethnic kind of concept, it has to be authentic. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Um, and the other issue that you heard me talk about was community. We do a lot of work in terms of messaging, in terms of the community, um, and how do we tell stories behind the food? Where does it come from? How do we embrace the farmer? Um, how do we embrace that small ranch to make sure that uh, everybody knows that we're buying the very best? Um, and we're trying to give the community a voice within 150 miles of our locations. I think that's critically important. And so I would, and I would encourage all of you to reach out. I would like to see more community-based kinds of foods and local stuff here than I saw today. Um, so um, I told some of the classrooms that we, we have gardens all over the place. Even at AT&T Park, we have a garden where we teach young people about the value of food um, and let them taste um, maybe jicama for the first time or something that they never tasted before. Um, because I really believe this next generation can help us change the world in terms of what good food's all about and what we put into our bodies. So we have this whole program called Healthy Kids in the Kitchen. Um, the one thing that I, that I worry about for university students in hospitality schools is the issue of um, it's not that you have to learn cost accounting. And you, yes, you do need the business courses and so forth. But it's how do you build relationships when you get out of here? How do you build those relationships? And how do you be able to communicate your dreams to other people? 
whether you're going to ask for money or you're trying to ask for a job or whatever. Um, I sat in a classroom, or I, I was in a classroom about a month ago at the University of San Francisco, and it was very quiet. I didn't say anything. I said, okay, I just want you to tell me, tell me your dreams, tell me what's on your mind. You would be surprised how, sh these are seniors, how shy young people are. They don't know how to get it out of them. They, 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 I don't know if they don't feel it, they have it in their head, but I'm telling you, building relationships and the relationships you build on this campus should stay with you because they're gonna help you in the future. But um, I'm gonna encourage you to go up to somebody you don't even know and ask them their name and tell me, tell me about yourself. Where are you from? What do you, that's really important. I wanna hire people that understand how to speak to other people because you're in hospitality. You need to be able to smile and say thank you and so forth. I could care less if you know accounting. I could teach you that shit. That's not the, the issue. What I'm concerned about is I want you to be excited about what you're doing and passionate. And I want you to be passionate to other people. That's the most important thing. Hopefully you'll be passionate about sustainability too because I think that's important too. But to be socially savvy, not only in media, but in speaking and writing is absolutely critical for when you leave here. It's critical now, too. So don't be afraid to be able to look at that and say, how do I come out of my shell? How do I do things that have never been done before? And especially if you're gonna start a company. And the last thing I wanna tell you is that if you are gonna be an entrepreneur or you're gonna go to work for a company, those companies that are gonna survive tomorrow and are successful today are those companies that have a purpose. They have a sense of purpose working towards the common good. More and more young people wanna change the world and that's great and I love that about this next generation and I believe you will. I believe also that there's a lot of companies out there that all they give a damn about is making profit you can make profit and still have purpose and do things good for community, for everything else that's going on around you. So what I would do is think about, especially if you want a product or a service and young people all want to own their own company or be an entrepreneur, look around the world, open up your eyes and say, what is it that I could do to disrupt and change, even if it's a mature industry, what could I do different? that's gonna excite people and do something for it that's really good that will help change the world or change a part of the industry like I did. I only changed a part of it. Um, I think that's important to think about purpose, your own purpose and how that purpose and that vision and that dream of yours connects to what you wanna do. Don't just go to work for some company just because they offer you a job. Go research the company and make sure they got their shit together and they're doing something good for the world. Then you're gonna be happy and you'll stay there and you'll even work harder and do the right thing. So that's my challenge to all of you. Um, so I think creating a sense of wonder and the experience that you're gonna bring to us in the future, uh, because I can tell you my generation doesn't get what I say. You know, sometimes it's on deaf ears, but I know young people do. So. Um, that's kind of my little, I think I'm over my time. We got 20 minutes or so, 15 minutes for questions and answers, and I'm happy to take them. And thank you for inviting me today. So. So I think this still works. So are there, anybody got any questions? I had a question. Yes. Uh, could you explain, could you talk more about Impossible Foods and your vision for the future with that? And uh, whether or not, I guess, is it sustainable to produce the, the burgers and the other products of those? Um, yes. Now, it's, uh, when we first started out, it was very, very expensive. But, um, you know, it's got heme in it. You know what heme is? It's from the plants, and that's the bleeding that it causes. Now, we just changed the formula from wheat to soy, so it is now gluten-free. It is now halal-free and it's now kosher certified. So I got all three of those things. That's a big deal on the eastern seaboard for the colleges. 
we are scaling, as we scale, the price of per pound will come down. It'll still be a little bit more expensive than uh, beef burgers, but it's going to be very sustainable. We're producing 200,000 pounds a month right now and selling it. And then uh, the, the, the Impossible Burger 2.0, that's the one with the soy heme as opposed to the wheat. Uh, that's all I have. Oh, no, I want to give a shout out. Uh, Brick City Grill and Ames has the Impossible Burger. You like it? Wait a minute, stay there. Do you like it? How does it taste? It's absolutely amazing. It is. Yeah. It's, it's better uh, than that thing called Beyond Meat you see in the grocery store. Don't yeah, eat yeah. that. It's like tofu. That's horrible stuff. <laughs> Go get the Impossible Burger someplace. It'll be in grocery stores, I think, in May, and Chubbs, and it'll be in a 12-ounce thing. You can make chili out of it. You can do meatballs, whatever you want. And so I'm not asking you to not eat a burger. You can eat a burger once a week. <coughs> Don't eat it three times a week. Eat this <coughs> once or twice a week. That's great. It's better for you. It's healthier. You should eat less protein. There's no question about it, and more vegetables. Everybody would be a lot healthier. So who else? <coughs> so if you haven't noticed in my sweatshirt, I'm also from California. Specifically, I'm from Portola Valley, which you probably know where that is, considering yes. you're three miles away from it. Um, so when I was 18, I left Portola Valley. There's not a huge agricultural community, as you know, in the Silicon Valley. If you go to Monterey, there's a lot of plant agriculture, Salinas, et cetera. But I just wanted to fact check something. So animals that are fed antibiotics, I'm an animal science major, so this is a really big issue for, for, this, for me to spelling myths like this. Animals that are fed antibiotics for preventative measures have to go through a 30-day, at least, withdrawal period, so there is no trace of antibiotics in any meat that is in the, gr the grocery stores. So what are you saying? I just wanted to clarify that, because you made it kind of seem like there is a ton of antibiotics in the meat. I know that was probably not your intended uh, rhetoric, but it just came I off that way. I can tell you that... I don't know. What's the grocery store change you had here? Safeway or what do you have? Ivy. Huh? Ivy. Oh, I okay. haven't heard Safeway in a long time. Okay, I don't know about Ivy. I don't. I don't know that. But we. I don't. Uh, look, I don't care if you go to Costco and buy meat there, or you go to Safeway or wherever the hell you go. I can promise you, I have been in every factory farm in this country, and I've talked to veterinarians like crazy. Most. Of the factory farms, the veterinarians that work for factory farms are paid by them. And they're going to tell you that they were prescribed and they're OK. I'm going to tell you that they were prescribed, but the animal was not sick. And I have enough scientists behind this to, sh to prove that they shoot them up to bring them to market. Uh, those of you that are their parents or grandparents were pig farmers or hog farmers, the, the, the life's, uh, the, usually uh, it takes about 14 months for a swine to get, is that right? Am I right? Correct. I'm not from Iowa. Is that right? Yeah. I Correct. can tell you within five to six months they're killing those pigs because they're shooting them up with antibiotics. Have you ever gone to a grocery store and seen those chickens that are huge? These the big breasts chickens? on yes. the chickens? Huh? Yes, I do. I knew that, know that they're uh, genetically... Um, They're also shot red. up with antibiotics. So I can, t I can just tell you that we have an antibiotic resistance issue in this country. We do. That is a big issue. That's and a big, big issue. are working on that. And I'm hoping, first of all, whether they go out of the system in 30 days or not, I don't trust that. And maybe the, the science does say that. But why should we even shoot them up to bring them to market quicker than they should? Why can't they live their natural and exhibit their their behaviors and live their natural lives. Now, I can tell you, I spoke to a group of Farm Bureau people a few years ago. They almost killed me and, and shot me out of the auditorium because they didn't agree with what I'm saying. These were, these were ranchers and farmers that didn't agree with me. And a lot of people don't agree with me, and that's OK. I still believe that. We ought to go back the old-fashioned way and raise our animals the right way, let them be out in the fields and do what the hell they want to do, and keep them out of gestation crates and battery cages and not shoot them up with antibiotics. And you're entitled to your opinion. That's my opinion. Thank you. So, yes. 
you're talking about using soybean meal um, in the burgers. Uh, are you concerned at all about the estrogen mimicking uh, capabilities of soybean meal? And also, uh, when you talk about substituting uh, substituting vegetables for meat protein, uh, are you aware that uh, you need to balance uh, rations based upon amino acid content, not just protein content, and that vegetables don't have a complete uh, profile of amino acids like meat does? Yeah, I'm not suggesting you, I'm not suggesting you become a vegetarian. I, I, I said eat less meat, at least less protein and more vegetables, that's all I said. I think we should le eat less of everything. We overeat in this country and we waste a lot of food. That's just my opinion. Um, I'm not a vegetarian. You know, I like a steak once in a while, but I've gone from, you know, if I can have three ounces or four ounces of meat, that's enough. It just fills, that's all I need and surround it with other things. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you completely go not eat meat. That's not what I'm saying. In terms of the soy, there's soy in everything. There are, there's more soy in almost every product that you can think about. Um, we're looking at substituting even that, but it's difficult at this point. We, we, I knew I had to get the wheat out, but I've got scientists working on the soy part of it too, and if I can eliminate that, I will do that, because I have the same concern you do. It's still a healthier product than a, than a beef burger, though. So, and I realize I'm in the middle of the country here where beef is a big deal. You know, I've taken a chance with you guys, but I'm just telling you that's where the world's going. I see it not only on the West Coast, but I see it on the East Coast. I see it in Chicago now. Um, I don't know about, I know there's a lot of cattle and there's a lot of feedlots around this place. Um, but that's where I think the world's going. I think this, I don't know how students feel, but I think this generation cares more about what they put in their bodies than we did when we were their age. So, who else? We are talking about uh, disruptive changes through technologies. Now, is it not against the social dimension of sustainability? Because we're trying to eliminate labor? Yeah, yeah. that is one part. Okay. I don't think, first of all, I don't think we're going to eliminate labor by doing this. I think what, what, what they're doing and what we're testing is new experiences. Um, we can't get enough people in the hospitality area of the United States. We can't get them to come to us. It's a very difficult part. You, the margins are so thin, you hiccup and you go off a page. Um, smiling every day and being hospitable takes a lot of work. Right. You have to have a passion and love for this, for food and for what we try to do. It has to be in your, almost in your gut. Um, I don't see that the robotic part of the, of the industry is going to impact that. I think it's going to create new experiences. Um, because we don't want to eat in the same place all the time. You, want, you don't go to the same restaurant all the time. You want different things. We want to experience different things. So I don't think it's going to take away from uh, me buying bones and roasting them and making stock and soup the old-fashioned way. They're not going to do that. But I think there's some things that we can do. I will tell you that the one thing I, I know for a fact is young people don't want to stand in line anymore. They don't want to do that. And they don't want to pay normally. They just they want to get on their phone, order it, and have it ready to go. Because we're in that kind of society. Um, I see it at Google. I see it at LinkedIn. I see it all over the place. Um, and I see it on college campuses. Nobody wants to wait in line anymore. So maybe that helps that process, speeding it up. What I hope it doesn't do is take away from the, from the quality of what we're trying to accomplish. Kind of a follow-up question. Like, if your operations people are underpaid, then why they will be, you know, uh, a, a server or maybe a kind of 
uh, the person who are supporting the business, they are underpaid, then why they will be in, in that industry? They will definitely go into some other industry. Why do people join the hospitality industry right. if because, it's an underpaid? Because, because we are not paying that that way. Well, I don't know what they pay here in Iowa, uh, but I'll give you an example, right. and, it, and it doesn't really work because San Francisco is so damn expensive to live. It's unbelievable. We pay between 22 and $25 an hour with full benefits for dishwashers. That's where I start. And our minimum wage is what, 11, 12 bucks? <laughs> I can't get enough people. So here it is, 725. I can't get enough people. I was telling somebody today, the interns that we hire in the summer make $20 an hour with benefits. I know, you're, when you, I know that that's not happening here, but it costs a lot of money to live there. So right. it's different, but I can't even can't get them. So but people go into this business because they have a love and passion for people. They care about food. They, they, I can't explain it. It's, it's ingrained in us. I'm Italian, so I, it was easy for me to get into this business. I had a mother that was right there teaching me everything from Italy. So right. that's a, that, but that's a whole different story. Thank you so much. So, okay, yes. Would you like me to go to the no, just say out loud. I'm not convinced that that's, that's the solution yet. I'm not convinced. It's too new. Um, I would stay away from, I would, I would follow the Seafood Watch program. You can get that free on an app and stay with the green and maybe the yellow and only buy and consume those fishes. Stay away from the red. If aquaculture, if, they, if it starts to become more sustainable and we feel that it's good, It'll get on the Seafood Watch program. They're, they have a whole cadre of scientists that deal with this. Um, I think you, somebody was telling me about tilapia and catfish here that you can get in Iowa. Both those fish are, are sustainable. And tilapia is a really nice, beautiful, sweet white fish. So is catfish if you cook it right. There's nothing wrong with it. It looks like hell, but <laughs> yes. Hi, Cooper. Um, my dream is to own a landscape design business that deals with green roofs, permeable pavement, uh, rain gardens, and uh, just sustainable practices construction-wise. Um, if I were to be in your shoes, or you were to be in my shoes, how would you go about those first steps? How would, how would you show that you really cared that this was sustainable and that this mattered? Well, I'd have to understand what your dream is. Um, I'd have to understand that first, but. What kind of first steps would you like go to? Like okay, you, plant, you, have, you have somebody coming next week that's going to talk about soil. Did I hear that? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow that's the place to start. You start on the ground. Start with soil. Um, we have an issue with soil. Farmers have an issue with soil in this country because of all the damn monocropping we do. Instead of, you know, three or four crops with, you know, in a, in a whole area. I was just thinking about that earlier. So I would start with soil, okay? Um, if, you, if you do that, at least you got the foundation. And then, I tell you what, when you write your mission statement and your dream, send it to me. I'll look at it and I'll, I'll give you some feedback. I'm a pretty honest guy. I, I'm, I'm not afraid to say what I have to say. What else? Anything else? So, yes. Can you talk about the Impossible Burger? I can say that we actually uh, sold it at the cafeteria. Here? Here? Serve it in the cafeteria at school? Yeah, I work at Oak Elm, that's like across the campus, and we sold the Impossible Burger. Was, who's tasted it? I have, it's good. <laughs> you like it? Okay, that's good. That's good to know. I did not know that. We were serving here. 
Anyway, um, thanks for putting up with me, and I appreciate the day that I spent with all of you. So thank you very much. So.